Okay, uh, I found the book. So this is The Baron in the Trees by Italo Calvino. It was on the 15th of June, 1767, that Cosimo Piovasco di Rondo, my brother, sat among us for the last time. And it might have been today, I remember it so clearly. We were in the dining room of our house at Ambrosa, the windows framing the thick branches of the great home oak in the park. It was midday, the old traditional dinner hour followed by our family, though by then most nobles had taken to the fashion set by the sluggard court of France, of dining halfway through the afternoon. A breeze was blowing from the sea, I remember, rustling the leaves. Cosimo said, I told you I don't want any, and I don't, and pushed away his plate full of snails. Never had we seen such a disobedience. At the head of the table was the Baron Arminio Pio Vasco de Rondo, our father, wearing a long wig over his ears in the style of Louis the Fourteenth, unfashionable like so much else about him. Between me and my brother was the Abbe Flachefleur, the family almoner and tutor of us two boys. We were facing our mother, the Baroness Corradino de Rondo, nicknamed the Generalessa, and our sister Batista, a kind of stay-at-home nun. At the other end of the table, opposite our father, sat, dressed in Turkish robes, the Cavalier Avocato Ania Silvio Carrega, lawyer, administrator, and waterworks supervisor of our estates, and our natural uncle being the illegitimate brother of our father. A few months ago, Cosimo having reached the age of 12 and I of 8, we had been admitted to the parental board. I had benefited by my brother's promotion and been moved up prematurely so that I should not be left to eat alone. Benefited is perhaps scarcely the word, for really it meant the end of our carefree life, Cosimo's and mine, and we were homesick for the meals in our little room, along with the Abbe Flachelefleur. The abbe was a dry, wrinkled old man, with a reputation as a Jansenist, and he had in fact escaped from his native land, the Dauphine, in order to avoid trial by the Inquisition. But the rigor of character for which he was so often praised, the severe mental discipline that he imposed on himself and others, was apt to yield to a deep-rooted urge toward apathy and indolence as if his long meditations with eyes staring into space had but brought on him a great weariness and boredom, and in every little difficulty now he had come to see a fate not worth opposing. Our meals in the abbe's company used to begin, after many a prayer, with ordered ritual, silent movements of spoons, and woe to anyone who raised his eyes from his plate or made the slightest sucking noise with the soup. But by the end of the first dish, the abbe was already tired, bored, looking into space and smacking his lips at every sip of wine, as if only the most fleeting and superficial sensations could get through to him. By the main dish, we were already using our hands. And by the end of the meal, we were throwing pear cores at each other, while the abbe, every now and then, let out one of his languid, Ooh, bien! Ooh, allahs! Now, at table with the family, up surged the intimate grudges that are such a burden of childhood. Having our father and mother always there in front of us, using knives and forks for the chicken, keeping our backs straight and our elbows down, what a strain it all was. Not to mention the presence of that odious sister of ours, Batista. So began a series of scenes, spiteful exchanges, punishments, retaliations, until the day when Cosimo refused the snails and decided to separate his fates from ours. These accumulating family resentments I myself only noticed later. Then I was eight. Everything seemed a game. The battle between us boys and grown-ups was the same in all families, and I did not realize that my brother's stubbornness hit something much deeper. Our father the Baron was a bore, it's true though not a bad man, a bore because his life was dominated by conflicting ideas, as often happens in periods of transition. 
the turbulence of the times and make some people feel a need to bester themselves, but in the opposite direction, backwards rather than forwards. So, with things boiling up all around him, our father had set his heart on regaining the last title of Duke of Ambrosa, and thought of nothing but genealogies and successions and family rivalries and alliances with grandees near and far. Life at our home was like a constant dress rehearsal for an appearance at court. Either the Emperor of Austria's, King Louis, or even the court of those mountaineers from Tunin. When, for instance, a turkey was served, our father would watch us like a hawk to see if we carved and boned it according to royal rules, and the abbe scarcely dared to touch a morsel lest he make some error of etiquette. For, poor man, he had to add his own rebukes to our father's. And we saw now a deceitful side of the cavalier Carrega. He would smuggle away whole legs under the folds of his Turkish robes to munch them bit by bit later, at his ease, hidden in the vineyard. And we could have sworn, although we never succeeded in catching him in the act, his movements were so quick, that he came to table with a pocket full of stripped bones to be left on the table in place of the hunks of turkey he whisked away. Our mother, the General Lessa, did not worry us. And even when serving herself at a table, she used brusque military manners. So, notch ein wenig, gut. And no one found fault with her. She held us not to etiquette, but to discipline, supporting the baron with parade ground rule orders. Sid's rigig, and wipe your nose. The only person really at ease was Batista, the nun of the house who would sit shredding her chicken with precise deliberation, fiber by fiber, using some sharp little knives, rather like surgeon's scalpels, which she alone had. The baron, who should have held her up to us as an example, did not dare look at her, for, with her staring eyes under the scarched coif, her narrow teeth set tight in her yellow rodent's face, she frightened him too. So it can be seen why our family bored brought out all the antagonisms, the incompatibilities between us, and all our follies and hypocrisies too, and why it was there that Cosimo's rebellion came to a head. That is why I have described it at some length. And anyway, it is the last set table we shall find in my brother's life, that's sure. It was also the only place where we would meet the grown-ups. The rest of the day our mother spent in her apartments, doing lace and embroidery and petite point. For in truth it was only in these traditionally womanly occupations that the General Lisa could vent her warrior's urge. The lace and embroidery were usually in the designs of geographical maps. Our mother would stretch them over cushions or tapestry and stick in pins and tiny flags, showing the disposition of battles in the wars of succession, which she knew by heart. Or she would embroider her canyons with the trajectories from the muzzle and the line of flights in the signs of anglings, for she was highly competent in ballistics, and also had at her disposal the entire library of her father, the general, with treaties on military lore and the atlases and tables of fire. Our mother was a von Kurtowitz, Conradine, daughter of General Conrad von Kurtowitz, who twenty years before, had commanded the Empress Maria Theresa's troops, which had occupied our area. A widower, the general had taken her around with him from camp to camp. There was nothing exciting about that, for they traveled well equipped, put up at the best castles, with the suites of servants, and she had spent her days making lace on a cushion. All the stories people told of her going into battle with them were legends. She had always been an ordinary little woman with a rosy face and a stub nose, in spite of that inherited zest for things military, which is perhaps a way of showing up her husband. Our father was one of the few nobles in our parts who had been on the side of the empire in that war. He had greeted General von Kurtowitz with open arms, put our retainers at his disposal, and even shown his great devotion to the imperial cause by Mary Conradine. All this with an eye to that duchy, and he was considerably put out when the imperial troops soon moved on, as usual, 
and the Jin Yos came down on him for taxes. But he had gained a good wife, the Generalessa, and she began to be called after the death of his, her father on the province expedition, when Maria Teresa sent her a golden collar on a cushion of brocade, a wife with whom he nearly always got along, even if she, born and bred in camps, thought of nothing but armies and battles and criticized him for being just an ineffectual schemer. But at heart, they were still living in the times of the wars of succession, she with her artillery, he with his genealogical trees. She dreaming of a career for us boys in some army, no matter which. He, on the other hand, seeing us married to a grand duchess and electress of the empire. With all this, they were excellent parents, but so absent-minded that Cosimo and I were usually left to our own devices during our childhood. Who can say if that was a good or bad thing? Cosimo's life was so uncommon, mine so ordinary and modest, and yet our childhood was spent together, both of us indifferent to the manias of adults, both trying to find paths unbeaten by others. We clambered about the trees, those innocent games come back to me now as a first initiation, an omen, but who could even have thought it then? We followed the mountain streams, jumping from rock to rock, exploring caves on the seashore, and we would slide down the marble banisters in our house. It was one of these slides that caused the first serious rift between Cosimo and our parents, for he was punished, unjustly, he declared, and since then harbored a grudge against the family, or society, or the world in general, which was to express itself later in its decision of that 15th of June. As a matter of fact, we had already been warned against sliding down the marble banisters, not out of fear that we might break a leg or an arm, for that never worried our parents, which was, I think, why we never broke anything, but because they feared that since we were growing up and gaining weight, we might knock over the busts of ancestors placed by our father on the banisters at the turn of every flight of stairs. Cosimo had, in fact, once brought down a bishop, a great-great-great-grandfather, matter and all. He was punished, and since then he had learned to break just before reaching the turn of a flight and jump off within a hair's breadth of running into a bust. I learned this trick too, for I copied all he did, except that I, ever more careful and timid, jumped off halfway down, or slid the rest bit by bit, with constant little breaks. One day, he was flying down the banisters like an arrow, when who should be coming up but the Abbe Flosche Le Fleur, meandering from stair to stair, with his breviary open in front of him, and his gaze fixed on space like a hen's. If only he had been fast asleep as usual. But no, he was in one of those sudden moods that occasionally came over him of extreme attention and awareness. He saw Cosimo and thought, Banisters, bust, he'll hit it. They'll blame me too. At every escapade of ours he used to be blamed also for not keeping an eye on us and he flung himself on the banister to catch my brother. Cosimo banned into the abbey, dragged him down the banister too. The old man was just skin and bones, found he could not break, and hit with double force the statue of our ancestor, Cassiaguera Pio Vasco the Crusader. They all landed in a heap at the foot of the stairs. The Crusader in smithereens, he was plaster, the abbey and Cosimo. There followed endless recriminations, a beating, his being locked in our room on bread and cold mind strewn. And Cosimo, who felt innocent because the faults had not been his but the abbe's, came out fiercely with the phrase, Fee on all your ancestors, father! A portent of his mission as a rebel. Our sister felt the same at heart. She too thought the isolation in which she lived had been forced on her by our father after that affair of the Marchesillo della Mela had always been a rebellious and lonely soul. What happened with the Marchesino, none of us ever really knew. How, as a son of a family hostile to ours, had he ever got into the house? And why? It could only be to seduce. No, rather to rape our sister, said father, in the long quarrel which ensued between the families. We boys, in fact, could never succeed in picturing that freckled simpleton as a seducer, least of all of our sister, who was certainly much stronger than him, 
and famous for beating the stable hands at competitions of physical strength. And then, why was it he who shouted for help, not her? And how did the servants who rushed to the scene, led by our father, come to find him with his breeches torn to strips as if by the talons of a tiger? The Della Mella family refused even to admit that their son had made an attempt on Batista's virtue or agreed to a marriage between them. So our sister was eventually confined to the house, dressed up as a nun, though without taking any vows even as a tertiary, in view of her rather dubious vocation. Her evil schemes found expression in cooking. She was a really excellent cook, for she had the primary gifts in the culinary art, diligence and imagination. But when she put her hand to it, no one ever knew what surprise might appear at table. Once she made some pate toast, really exquisite, of rat's livers. This she never told us until we had eaten them and pronounced them good, and some grasshopper's claws, crisp and sectioned, laid on the open tart in a mosaic, and pig's tails baked as if they were little cakes. And once she cooked a complete porcupine with all its quills, who knows why, probably just to give us all a shock at the raising of the dish cover, for even she, who usually ate everything, however odd, that she had prepared herself, refused to taste it, though it was a baby porcupine, rosy and certainly tender. In fact, most of these horrible dishes of hers were thought out just for effect, rather than for any pleasure in making us eat disgusting food with her. These dishes of Batista's were works of the most delicate animal or vegetable jewelry, cauliflower heads with hair's ears set on a collar of fur, or a pig's head from whose mouth stuck a scarlet lobster as if putting out its tongue, and the lobster was holding the pig's tongue in its pincers as if they had torn it out. And finally the snails. She had managed to behead I don't know how many snails, and the heads, those soft little equine heads, she had inserted, I think with a toothpick, each in a wet wire mesh. They looked, as they came on the table, like a flight of tiny swans. Even more revolting than the sight of these delicacies was the thought of Batista's zealous determination in preparing them, of those thin hands of hers tearing the little creatures to pieces. It was as a protest against this macabre fantasy of our sisters that my brother and I were incited to show our sympathy with the poor tortured creatures, in our disgust, too, for the flavor of cooked snails, a revolt really against everything and everybody. And from this, not surprisingly, stemmed Cosimo's gesture and all that followed after. We had devised a plan. When the cavalier brought home a basket full of eatable snails, these were put into a barrel in the cellar, so they should starve, or eat only bran and so be purged. When we moved the planks covering these barrels, an inferno was revealed, snails moving up the starves with a languor which was already a presage of their death agony amid remnants of bronze, streaks of opaque, clotted slime, and multicolored excrement, mementos of the good old days of open air and grass. Some of them were right outside their shells with heads extended and waving horns, some all curled up, showing a different pair of antenna. Others were grouped like village gossips, others shut and sleeping, others dead, with their shells upside down. To save them from meeting that sinister cook, and to save us from her ministrations too. We made a hole in the bottom of the barrel, and from there traced as hidden a trail as we could, with bits of chopped grass and honey, behind barrels and various tools in the cellar, to draw the snails towards a little window facing an uncultivated grassy field. Next day we went down into the cellar to see the results, and we inspected the walls and passage by candlelight. One here! and another there, and just to see where this one got to. Already there was an almost continuous line of snails moving from the barrel over the flagstones and walls towards the little window, following our trail. Quick, snaily whalies, hurry up, out! We could not help shouting at them, seeing the creatures moving along so slowly, now and then going around and around in circles over the rough cellar walls, attracted by the occasional fly droppings and mildew. But the cellar was dark and cluttered. We hoped no one would notice them, and that they would all have time to escape. 
But that restless creature, our sister Batista, used to spend the nights wandering around the house in search of mice, holding a candelabra with a musket under her arm. That night she went down into the cellar, and the candle light shone on a lost snail on the ceiling with a trail of silvery slime. A shot ran out. We all started into our beds, but soon dropped our heads back into the pillow, used as we were to the night hunts of our resident nun. But Batista, having destroyed the snail and brought down a hunk of plaster with her instinctive shot, now began to shout in that stringent voice of hers. Help! They are all escaping! Help! Half-dressed servants hurried to her. Our father came armed with a saber, the abbe without his wig. The cavalier did not even find out what was happening, but ran off into the woods to avoid the fuss and went to sleep in a haystack. Everyone began hunting the snails all over the cellar by the light of torches, no one with any real will, but stubbornly, so as not to admit being disturbed for nothing. They found a hole in the barrel, and at once realized we had made it. Our father came with the coachman's whip and seized us from bed. Then our backs, buttocks, and legs, covered with violet wheels, we were locked into the squalid little room used as a prison. They kept us there three days. On bread, water, lettuce, beef rinds, and cold minestrone, which luckily we liked. Then, as if nothing had happened, we were brought out for our first family meal at midday on that 15th of June. And what should the kitchen superintendent, our sister Batista, have prepared for us but snail soup and snails as a main course? Cosimo refused, touched even a mouthful. Eat up, or we'll shut you in the little room again. I yielded and began to chew the wretched mollusks, a cowardice on my part, which had the effect of making my brother feel more alone than ever, so that his leaving us was also partly a protest against me for letting him down. But I was only eight years old, and then how can I compare my own strength of will, particularly as a child, to the superhuman tenacity which my brother showed throughout his life? Well said her father to Cosimo. No, and no again, exclaimed Cosimo, and pushed his plate away. Leave the table. But Cosimo had already turned his back on us all and was leaving the room. Where are you going? We saw him through the glass door as he picked up his tricorn and rapier. I know where I'm going. And he ran out into the garden. In a little while, we watched him from the windows climbing up the home's oak. He was dressed up in the most formal clothes and headdress, because our father insisted on his appearing at table this way in spite of his twelve years of age. Powdered hair with a ribbon around the queue, three-cornered hat, lace stock and ruffles, green tunic with pointed tails, purple breeches, rapier, and long white leather gaiters halfway up his legs, the only concession to a mode of dressing more suitable to our country life. I, being only eight, was exempted from powdered hair except on gala occasions and from the rapier which I should have liked to wear. So he climbed up the knobby old tree, moving his arms and legs along the branches with a sureness and speed which came to him from years of our practicing together. I have mentioned that we used to spend hours and hours on the trees, and not for ulterior motives as most boys, who go up only in search of fruit or bird nests, but for the pleasure of getting over difficult parts of the trunks and forks, reaching as high as we could, and finding a good perch on which to pause and look down at the world below, to call and joke at those passing by. So I found it quite natural that Cosimo's first thought, at that unjust attack on him, was to climb up the home oak, to us a familiar tree spreading its branches to the height of the dining room windows, through which he could show his proud, offended air to the whole family. Worshist! Worshist! Now he'll fall down, poor little thing! Anxiously exclaimed our mother, who would not have turned a hair at seeing us under cannon fire, but was nevertheless in agony over our games. Cosimo climbed up to the fork of a big branch, where he could see a settle comfortably, and sat himself down there, his legs dangling, his arms crossed with hands tucked under his elbows, his head buried in his shoulders, his tricorn hats tilted over his forehead. 
Our father leaned out the window. When you're tired of being up there, you'll change your mind, he shouted. I'll never change my mind, examined my brother from the branch. You'll see as soon as you come down. I'll never come down again. And he kept his word.